ever see an airplane take off from the back of a truck, you just have. And this airplane carries a nuclear reactor in operation, producing atomic energy. This reactor does not power the plane, but someday in the future, nuclear engines will. And with this test plane, they work out the problems of shielding and instrumentation peculiar to the age of atomic-powered flight, in which planes will be able to fly around the world non-stop. Here's an airplane that can operate with equal facility from airport runways, water, ice, snow, or even sand. And here, an airborne filling station accommodating three customers at a time. Experimental planes have been developed, which after being carried aloft by mother planes to conserve fuel, then go on up to altitudes above 100,000 feet to achieve speeds well beyond 2,000 miles an hour. The rocket engine of this X-2, burning a mixture of liquid oxygen and alcohol, has propelled man through space at a greater rate than had ever before been achieved. Three times the speed of sound or even faster. The exact figures are classified information. On this strictly experimental plane to save weight, the conventional landing gear is replaced by lightweight skids. The remarkable achievements of American aviation become even more remarkable when we realize how many of them were chalked up in just a very small span of years. It was only a dozen years ago that planes like these were raining destruction on Axis territory during World War II. How big, how powerful, how effective they were at the time. Nazi war effort, Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich was disintegrating like the factories, railroad yards, docks, depots, and other targets of bombing missions, involving as many as a thousand planes in a single raid. The vaunted Luftwaffe had long since been committed almost exclusively to a defensive role, but even with that limited assignment, the German planes and pilots were unable to hold back the inevitable. Knocked out of the sky far faster than they could be replaced, the dwindling enemy airmen eventually relinquished to Allied forces complete control of the air. This was the result. At sea, too, where the Axis nations achieved their nearest approach to victory, Allied air power in the form of anti-submarine planes operating from small, converted escort carriers brought the U-boat menace under control. Ranging far out from the convoys, they held the subs under and hampered their operations. They guided escort ships to the subs' positions, and finally they helped destroy the menace and kept the sea lanes open to our shipping. Who would have thought airplanes would meet a challenge that came from beneath the surface of the sea? Well, during World War II, airplanes, or rather the men who designed them, built them and flew them, met a lot of challenges, not the least of which was the miracle of mass production. For their time, the planes turned out were good planes, the best, and produced in overwhelming numbers. Thus it was that in one year alone, 1944, our aircraft industries turned out an astounding 96,000 planes, including the two B-29s, which were to drop atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. that brought Japanese capitulation, the end of the war. What a night this was, what vast relief, what bubbling enthusiasm. The war has been won. The days of peace seemed to stretch out endlessly into the future. Men turned their minds from thoughts of battle to happier problems like medium or well done. 
ketchup or mustard, fingers or forks, The sound of aircraft engines no longer is a preliminary to the sound of bombs and gunfire. Now it means quick, convenient, comfortable travel, as more and more millions of Americans are to discover during the years ahead. Air travel is to become the biggest form of public intercity transportation. The service becomes ever faster, more luxurious, more reliable. American-built planes are to carry 85 to 90 percent of the passengers of all the world's airlines in comfort and safety. Before long, we would even be traveling in jetliners coast to coast between breakfast and lunch. The military planes back in 1946, well, with all our prospects for perpetual peace, they were mothballed, wrapped up in cocoons and put away in the forlorn hope that if they were ever needed in the future, they would serve as well as they had in the past. With the coming of peace, America had scurried toward demobilization with headlong urgency. Our vast, smoothly functioning air power machine, supreme over all others, was scuttled. Production was cut to practically nothing, from 96,000 military planes in 44 to 1,600 in 46. The assumption was widespread that industrial installations, too, could be mothballed, again with the optimistic idea that, if necessary, they could be reactivated to resume production as before. But such thinking overlooked an important fact. Even before the war had ended, the development of a new type of engine had rendered every combat aircraft in the world obsolete. This was the jet engine. Using an old principle of propulsion finally made practical by modern technology, this new engine produced four to five times as much power for its weight than was ever before possible. The jet engine brought in a tremendous quantity of air, compressed it, then injected into it a vaporized fuel and ignited the mixture. The resultant reaction from the escaping exhaust gave aircraft unprecedentedly powerful thrust. During the war, our facilities were committed not to such jet engines, but to mass production of aircraft of proven design in order to win the war and even following the war, drastically reduced research and development staffs were able to give jets, rockets, and guided missiles but a fraction of the attention they deserved. Working on only token orders, the aircraft industry strove to keep abreast of fast-breaking developments which threatened to topple us from our undisputed position as world leader in the field of aviation. By dint of sheer determination, the industries managed to adjust themselves to the revolutionary new era into which the world had moved. The Russians, meanwhile, guided in large part by captured German scientists, launched an all-out program aimed at catching up with and surpassing us in the air. Korea, in 1950, showed how well they'd been making out during the five years of our big sleep. They had built new plants, expanded production, and their aircraft industry had advanced to the point where it could put planes like the MiG-15s into the air in quantity. By 1950, according to reliable estimates, they had 20,000 first-line aircraft and another 20,000 in reserve. Fortunately, we hadn't been completely asleep. The Russians had narrowed the gap between us, but they had not quite caught up. Our early jets, here scrambling from Korean airstrips, were able to maintain superiority in the air. In the first real test of strength between jet-powered combat forces, our planes knocked the enemies out of the skies at the unheard of ratio of 14 of theirs for every one of ours. As with the Messerschmitts and the Zeros in World War II, so with the MiGs in Korea, American planes and pilots proved superior. Again, as when Hitler's air power disintegrated, ground targets became sitting ducks, wide open for bombing, strafing, and the application of a jellied petroleum incendiary called napalm.
Back home, the drastic change in aerial warfare brought equally drastic changes in production requirements. Our vast World War II production machine, which had not been kept up to date, was for the most part of little value now. New plants were built and tools and equipment to produce the new aircraft were installed in facilities like this, crammed full of costly precision equipment. In five years, the trend had changed. Now, military strength depended on science and engineering of the highest caliber, extremely precise special tools, not just on masses of production personnel. Whatever the need, the nation was in a mood to provide it. The debate was not whether to expand our military air power, but to what extent. Here is what was decided and what was accomplished. In 1950 and 51, 48 wings, made up chiefly of piston engine planes. By 52, more than twice that number. 95 wings. Then it was raised to 106, 115, 121, and by midsummer 1957 to a maximum target strength of 137 wings, plus 17 Navy air groups, and three wings for the Marine Corps. Even more important than the figures was the decision after Korea not to try to compete with the Russians in quantity of planes turned out, but rather to stay as far ahead as possible in quality. Today's aircraft, any nation's aircraft, are always obsolescent. Better planes are in production. Better ones still are being tested. And even better ones than those are several years ahead, still being designed. Technology has overwhelmed mere numbers. Modern aircraft is an amazing piece of machinery. A far cry from the planes that helped decide a worldwide conflict only a little more than a decade ago. Today a plane is the product of the utmost precision. Safety, speed, range, climb, firepower, instrumentation. Every performance characteristic has been upgraded several hundred percent at least. The upgrading, the increased performance requirements, apply not only to the planes, but also to the ships, men, communications, and everything else required to put the planes in the air and help them to accomplish their missions and return home safely. The increased requirements for high precision, very close tolerances, is evident everywhere in a modern jet airplane factory, as well as in the plants that supply all the vital components. Sheet metal, which 10 years ago had to be accurate in thickness to a 16th or a 32nd of an inch, now must be accurate to a 100th or a 200th of an inch. In the machine shop, tolerances have shrunk even more. Here, they're measured in 10 thousandths of an inch, the delicacy of a watch works for a machine that must have the sturdiness of a battering ram. Today, parts are measured to closer tolerances than were the tools of a few years ago. Precision indeed. Just a scuff mark can slow up a supersonic fighter as much as 20 miles an hour. Surface smoothness is measured in millionths of an inch. The ratio of thickness to length and width in some airplane wings is comparable to that in a double-edged razor blade. Yet those wings have the strength to carry loads of thousands of times their own weight through the sound barrier. The modern aircraft is infinitely complex. 
For example, the electrical system of a medium jet bomber requires 250% more wire than did the comparable piston engine plane. 82% more switches and junction boxes, three times as many batteries, 150% more relays, plus many additional pounds of clips, nuts, and bolts. The modern aircraft requires more engineering. Engineers are the men who take the findings of the fundamental research scientists and convert them into practical reality. They specialize like doctors. Some work in electronics, some in metallurgy, some in aerodynamics. There are scores of engineering categories. Whatever their chosen field, they must devote long years of study to acquiring the necessary know-how, then putting it into effect. Today's airplane requires acres of blueprints you might say we've broken the paper barrier, for the weight of the paper used in blueprints and drawings for a new plane now exceeds the weight of the plane itself. The engineer's task is complicated by the fact that today the design of an airplane is rarely made permanently standard. Now, in a period when quality is paramount, these perfectionists go on making the planes ever better. Take just the shape of today's aircraft. World War II planes did not demand extensive aerodynamic analysis. But look at just a few of the variety of wing configurations being used now. These are real planes with very real jobs to perform. The canopy-like object on this WV-2 encloses radar equipment for long-range reconnaissance missions. Development of such strange new shapes requires involved, prolonged airflow studies at altitudes 10 to 25 miles above the Earth. The plane designs must be tested at speeds approaching, passing, and way beyond the speed of sound in order to solve complicated problems of stability, to mention just one example. Wind tunnel hours for a bomber of a dozen years ago totaled about 250. Today, tests in the wind tunnel take 8,000 hours and up as the engineers study things like the effects of shock waves, air so compressed that it actually becomes visible. Now we are extending the frontiers of man's knowledge about the way metals will react under certain circumstances. We have pressed physical materials to the apparent limits of their ability to hold together. At speeds being sought and being achieved, metals strong enough to support great buildings droop and melt away like wax. Here in a wind tunnel of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics are simulated with the plane model the conditions created by air rushing past an aircraft or missile flying 4,500 miles an hour. Is this so-called heat barrier impenetrable? No, already it's being broken through. Like the other would-be barriers to progress, it too will give way to research and engineering. Imagine the engineering problems involved in devising a system for ensuring the pilot's safety when the temperature of his plane might be 60 or 70 degrees below zero one minute and many hundreds of degrees above zero just a couple of minutes later. To solve such problems, tests must be made on every part of the plane, tires, instruments, Metals. Engines. All are tested to the breaking point, placed under tremendous strains, driven to destruction under conditions far beyond anything to be expected in the air. Multiply this by the increased number of parts that go into an aircraft, and it's easy to see why today's aircraft cost so much more than did those of World War II. There's simply so much more to a modern plane. The flying machines that represent air power now are not the products of single companies which can fabricate and assemble all the components by themselves. Rather, they are the result of coordinated effort by tens of thousands of companies, large and small, providing all sorts of dissimilar elements, like transistors. Electric motors. Springs smaller than your little finger.
Aluminum extrusions. Rivets, nuts, and bolts. And most important of all, jet power plants, whose development has paced the recent history of aviation progress. To supply all these parts, 50,000 companies are in competition with each other, which helps to account for the continuing process of cost reduction in the face of increased prices for plants, equipment, raw materials, and labor. The price tag on planes is higher today than it used to be, but not in terms of what those planes consist of and what they can do. From the blueprint stage on, cost analysts follow the project through, alert for ways of saving dollars without cutting corners. Each company knows that if it can't fulfill a contract on time and at the specified cost, some other company probably can and will. Many industries can accurately estimate future sales and the resultant requirements in plant, raw materials, and personnel. And thus, they can prepare in advance for the months or even the years ahead. But in the past, the aircraft industry has been racked by conditions of peaks and valleys, ups and downs which inevitably upset the best laid plans and resulted in increased costs and decreased performance. No industry can operate effectively when it must hire personnel, build plants and buy equipment always in the heat of an emergency. The relative stability which has existed during the past few years helps account for the steady, rapid, planned growth of our air power. It has helped bring in six years an increase in combat strength of 160 percent, while the new weapons have brought an increase in effectiveness that is immeasurable. One plane today carries more destructive power than all the bombs dropped by all the U.S. planes in the past three wars. Unfortunately, the Russians have planes which we can only assume, which we must assume, have the same power. A recent Soviet air show for American visitors revealed only as much as the Russians wanted to be revealed. But the planes put on exhibition convinced experts who viewed the show that we have no grounds for complacency. The question arises, what do we do? Well, what we do is what we have been doing. We strain every nerve to stay ahead in quality. That means projects like this one at Santa Susana, California, where the most potent of the modern rocket engines are perfected for long-range hypersonic missiles. Here, engines designed to fly above the atmosphere are lashed to earth and fired as hundreds of instruments record their performance. rocket-powered weapons of many kinds, air to ground, air to air, as demonstrated here against an unmanned radio-controlled drone plane. ground-to-ground -ground missiles that someday will deliver nuclear warheads accurately to targets 5,000 miles away. Here's what the world looks like from the missile. Already we are in the process of placing man-made satellites out here in space, 
to circle the Earth in a matter of minutes. Our potential enemies are pushing their research and development programs with top priorities in materials, tools, and scientific personnel. Our aircraft industries, operating under the competition traditional to our free enterprise system, will go on striving to keep the aviation of the free world out in front and succeeding as they have in the past when presented with a well-thought-out, long-range program, an intelligent design for survival.